People expected not just a red wave on Tuesday, but a red wave among Hispanic voters. But among the many surprises of this week, that did not happen. It happened in Florida. Ron DeSantis and Marco Rubio dominated the Cuban vote and even won over traditionally Democratic Puerto Rican voters, it seems like. But more broadly, the Hispanic red wave never maternalized. In fact, it receded. In Texas, Latino support for Republicans regressed from past elections. Democrats won most of the seats in the heavily Hispanic Rio Grande Valley. So what is this exactly? Why did this happen? And what does it tell us about the future? Pedro Gonzalez is an associate editor at Chronicles Magazine and joins us tonight. Hey, Pedro, thanks for coming on. What, how do you interpret this? I know it's only a few days ago, but what do you make of it? Well, Tucker, Latinos are not a monolith. Cubans in right. Florida don't think and vote the same way as Mexicans in California. What we can say is Republicans improved in some places, but Democrats seem to still maintain a hold over majority Latino support across the country. But these people are persuadable. They can be moved. But what was the GOP's ground game ahead of midterms? I think it's important to reflect on this. Democrats do outreach in key places. They spend millions rewriting voting rules and regulations in their favor. The priority, on the other hand, of the political machine around Kevin McCarthy was to target America First candidates like Joe Kent in Washington and Anthony Sabatini in Florida because they were viewed as threats to his power. What was the GOP's vision, its promise to Americans? Kevin McCarthy said entitlement reform, in other words, cuts to Social Security and Medicare, would be a top GOP priority after midterms. And also, of course, getting another $50 billion for Ukraine uh, by January. So we, we cut grandma's social security check and we mail it to Zelensky, right? It's not hard to see why Republicans were underwhelming, not just with Latinos, but other persuadable voters when you have this kind of leadership. But this is also, Tucker, why I'm not pessimistic, because when you have Washington generals like this running the party, you can't really say that we've begun to fight. Well, I think that's exactly right. So if you were going to make the, this is a long conversation, I hope it come back for another hour, but if you could like distill the message that works, not just to Latino voters, but just to working class voters, what would it be? That America is not a bazaar. It's not an open air marketplace for the world to plunder. It's a home to a real people. It's a home that we, excuse me, sorry that it's a home to a real flesh and blood people. And that means that we have an obligation to keep our communities safe. We have an obligation to secure our border. We have an obligation to not just post memes about how Biden and the Democrats have failed on crime, but to actually do something, propose solutions, instead of just adopting the Democratic Party's policies on crime and then just reframing them as somehow fiscally conservative or America first, which is what the GOP has done historically. How about being an anti-war party, or in this case, anti-nuclear war? The reason that the GOP couldn't talk about this, of course, is because the party leadership actually is pro-war. But yeah. the thing about the war in Ukraine is that you can connect it to everything from the cost, of the cost of fuel in your car to the rising cost of food on your table. But again, Republicans are frankly cowards, and we're not willing to take on this issue. It's, I, think, I think you're exactly over the target, so to speak. Pedro Gonzalez, great to see you tonight. Mm -hmm. Thank you.